Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to all of you, including Paul Boyer, Kevin Morgan, Paul Teason, and brand new patron, James. James, 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 On this episode of DTNS, YouTube's plan to hype smaller channels, the surprisingly positive iPhone 16 reviews, and what it may means that Sony stuck with AMD for the next PlayStation over Intel. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, September 18th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. It is a wonderful day in the neighborhood of technology. Uh, we got some good, we have some not so good, and then we have some really interesting. Stick around with us for the show. Let's start with the quick hits. The GSM Association said Tuesday it's working to enable end-to-end -end encryption, or E2EE, on messages between Android phones and iPhones. Now, on Monday, Apple's iOS 18 update replaced SMS with RCS as, as default messaging for texts sent between iPhone and Android users. That allows for cross-platform sharing of high-res media. You get read receipts. You see typing indicators. However, Apple's version of RCS doesn't currently use E2EE. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, maybe that will help my doc to come back. Oh, there it is. Um, more details related to the pagers that exploded in Lebanon, injuring thousands and killing at least a dozen. Uh, the pagers were now identified as Gold Apollo AR924 models. Uh, supposedly, they have an 85-day battery life. Taiwan's Gold Apollo says that it didn't make them. It licensed the name to a Hungarian company called BAC Consulting, which they said they made those pagers. Uh, BAC Consulting said, we were an intermediary. We didn't make the pagers either. We still don't know for sure. Uh, it appears that there was explosive content in the pagers, that they were not exploded by malware that caused the batteries uh, to overload. Just the intensity of the explosions is too big uh, to be consistent with that. And Wednesday, several two-way radios were also detonated in Lebanon. Apple has pulled the iPad OS 18 update for the M4 iPad Pro, at least temporarily, after some users reported the update bricked their devices. And in some cases, they had to get a total replacement. Apple tells Mac rumors <laughs> in very Apple fashion, we have temporarily removed the iPad OS 18 update for M4 iPad Pro models as we work to resolve an issue that's impacting a small number of devices. Small is relative. Number. If it's your device, it sucks. It doesn't feel small. Yeah. No. Yeah. On Tuesday, California Governor Gavin Newsom signed AB 2655 into law, requiring large online platforms to remove or label AI deepfakes related to elections. Uh, within 120 days before the election and 60 days after, and make it easier to report this kind of content. AB 2355 also got signed. It requires disclosure of political advertisements if you use any AI-generated or modified material. AB 2602 requires studios to get permission from an actor before creating an AI-generated replica of their voice or likeness and give a reasonably specific description of how they're going to use it. And AB 18 1836 prohibits content studios from creating digital replicas of deceased performers until you have got consent from their estate. Governor Newsom has 38 more bills sitting on his desk related to AI that he has not signed yet, including one related to artificial generalized intelligence. Australian police said Wednesday that they arrested 38 people who are suspected of using encrypted app Ghost for criminal purposes. Australian Federal Police Deputy Commissioner Ian McCartney said that law enforcement agencies around the world were also making arrests, uh, including in Canada, Sweden, Ireland, and Italy. And that is a look at the quick hits. YouTube announced a bunch of new stuff today. The company is expanding its community feature. Uh, that's for creators to not only share text posts and polls and images with subscribers, but for those subscribers to chat amongst themselves. Very, you know, Twitter-like. This is essentially a social media feed. It's going to be integrated into the main YouTube experience. YouTube Shorts is now going to integrate uh, Google's AI video model, VO, to help users generate short-form videos with editing and effects generation uh, features. 
YouTube is also launching a new app for smart TVs with a bigger focus on organizing episodic content, seasons, episodes, that kind of thing, making it more TV-like, including previews to help viewers discover new content. And then YouTube also has a new tool called Hype, designed to help a smaller channel get noticed by more subscribers who like what they do but might not find them in the general YouTube way where, you know, the biggest channels tend to generate the most buzz and get the most subscribers and then get recommended more. So if you get a hyped video and that uh, a, a new button that I as a subscriber um, or as a just a creation enjoyer uh, can give you a, a hype if I like your video it, and you get enough of those, it shows up on a leaderboard. Everybody on YouTube can see this leaderboard. It's similar to YouTube trending, but this one's different. It's specifically meant for small, smaller channels you just might not have heard of. You know, it's, it's very much the, it's the indie band that you've probably never heard of type thing, but very, very good. I saw it here first. Um, and that is what people specifically choose to recommend rather than what they just watch, which is part of YouTube's algorithm now. Yeah, and it'll be separate from the algorithm. There'll be a separate hype section with the leaderboard. Every person will get a hype section of their own that's customized to their own tastes. Uh, but the key here is that they made it so that it really should show smaller channels. If you have more than 500,000 subscribers, you don't get the hype button ever. It's only for smaller channels. Uh, and users can only use the hype button three times a week. Uh, so you'll, you'll want to make sure you use it for channels you really enjoy. And... The smaller the channel, the more hype points you get per click. So that that channel that has 499,000 is going to get like one hype point, but the channel that only has 100 subscribers is going to get, I don't know, 500 hype points or something like that. So they really are trying to use it to have dedicated viewers recommend channels they really enjoy. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is, it's a great way to, I mean, sure, anything can be gamed, I suppose. But, you know, for YouTube to say, listen, if you're, if you're a big enough channel, you've got your audience. You don't need the help. That's great. Yeah. Like, yeah. like keep, keep, keep on keeping on. But if you're, if you're small and you're trying to be noticed, I mean, there's so many creators out there. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I launch shows all the time Endless. where I'm like, no yeah. one's listening you know, <laughs> or, you know, or watching that kind of stuff. You know, it, it, it. Anything helps. And if someone says, hey, you're pretty great, and then you get noticed, and then you get to a certain tier, and then you're no longer part of the hype system, well, then it worked. Yeah, it breaks you out of that bubble. What I like about it is uh, there's this percentage thing going on, and it's true on YouTube. I know it's true on on, uh, on Twitch as well, but there's like a 1% group. And the 1% everyone always thinks are the huge streamers that are doing 50000 for a live stream or... 20 million views on their videos or whatever it is, the Mr. Beast of the world. And the truth is a lot of us are in the 1%. It's a very weird kind of thing, but you have those mega producers and then a very quick drop off. And the rest of that 1% tail is made up of people like us who are just trying to make decent videos, 25,000 followers, blah, blah, blah. Um, this gives, I think that chunk an increased chance of being noticed, but it also the long tail after us who never gets noticed or at least feels like they don't uh, have a chance to also what I love about it the most is the thing Tom's talked about a couple of times. We did it this morning on TMS as well, but they've built in a way to not have it gamed. And that's important here. If I could just go spam these all day to a million channels, there'd be no point to it. It'd be like doing likes or something. It's like, there's no real value in that, in that. But if you know that you've got a limited number that you can spend and you really spend those on the channels that impressed you or that you stumbled across and went, whoa, this is rad. I, I don't know why they've only got three views. Then those those become more valuable. That's actual feedback that, that uh, YouTube can see and say, oh, push them up in the algorithm. Let's get those guys more uh, more velocity. And I think it benefits them, not just us, but them because their advertising dollars they want to get that across the spectrum and across interest spectrums, not just the Mr. Beasts of the world and the big giant channels that have the exact same ad uh, rates and everything they've been doing forever. Like, mm -hmm. get the whole tail covered. And I think that's really smart. Yeah, and I mean, I don't think, you know, if, if, if I start a new channel tomorrow and, you know, I get a few hype clicks, you know, like a few people care, but I don't get on the leaderboard. It doesn't really move the needle for me. It doesn't mean it's bad content. 
I mean, maybe it is, <laughs> but it, but that doesn't mean that my content is bad. It might mean I need to rethink how I'm trying to reach people. You know, it's all good intel for a creator, I think. Yeah. yeah. I like what Laminar is saying in our own YouTube chat. Uh, I wonder if it helps create more super fans because hype feels like currency, right? So yeah. people will hoard their hype for their favorite artist. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be good. Uh, well, it's that day. The reviews are coming out of NDA for the iPhone 16, which ships on Friday, along with all of the newly announced Apple products like AirPods 4 and uh, the new watch. The summary is basically that the camera and to some extent the new camera control button are wonderful. And in some reviewers' estimates, make it worth the upgrade. I was very surprised to see headlines that said iPhone 16's camera worth the upgrade because I expected a lot of iPhone 16. Well, if you haven't upgraded in a while, I guess. Otherwise, not that much different. Um, also, the battery life is apparently stunning. Uh, and that is a big uh, selling point as well. The lack of Apple intelligence is disappointing. That That is universal across these reviews. But they say, like, when it comes, that'll help. Uh, 9to5Mac does a great job of giving you an over review of all the different reviews that are out there. Here's some of the things they noted. Uh, the Verge's Nilay Patel really liked photographic styles. I don't think we've heard people talk about this much, but in the new camera app, you get color, uh, which is basically saturation, palette, which is your range of colors, and tone, which is tone mapping, uh, but it adds shadow back to photos. And Nilay wrote, turning down the tone control felt like a sigh of relief. I prefer photos with less aggressive tone mapping. Uh, so I don't know if either one of you have ever done this, but you know, this lets you just take away some of the processing that's done to the photo. And Neil, I said it worked really well on the iPhone 16 and he liked it. Yeah. I mean, this is something that this kind of started with Instagram, at least for me, where it was like, oh, okay, you know, you get a filter, you can make a photo look a certain way, but it's not really the way that the photo looks. And yeah. then, and then it started to get into, yeah, so, sort of HDR weirdness. And you see a lot of that now just in general. And it's not that someone is trying to say like, this is the photo that I took. It's just over-processed. Yeah. A lot of over-processed stuff out there. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think I'm more excited about this upgrade since these reviews, because I was one of those people that were like, Eh, what Tim showed off and company didn't look that different to me. I think I'll go with a 15. I'm on a 14 currently. So I thought, well, I'll get a good deal on a 15. And I may change service providers. I don't know. It's kind of one of those moments for me where I can switch around. And the reviews telling me how much better that camera is, it's making me want to hang out and get it. Um, yeah. So CNN, yeah. CNN thought the ultra wide camera was a big uh, difference maker too, going from 12 megapixels to 48. That's it. That's a significant, yeah. Bomb. Sizable. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. one thing that impressed me the most, The Verge has this demo of the reporter walking through an extremely busy alleyway, Market Street. And the first run through is him talking while filming so you can hear just the overwhelming sound. And he's, he's completely being it's drowned out by the street noise. Street noise, and street all noise that. cars, people, all that. It's really bad. And I'm very skeptical of this stuff. I didn't expect it to work very well. Then he did all the isolation tricks that you can do. There's multiple modes. They're really impressive. I think cr content creators who are already in this ecosystem, perhaps, and love the cameras, you know, up, leading up till now, I think that alone is a huge deal. And I think once you've seen that demo and experienced it and seen what you can do with it, you almost like you're cutting yeah, out yeah. a bunch of middleman time that you would have to do with editing and voice isolation, a bunch of audio work. Like, it's I see really why that nice. was the selling factor for you, Scott. That's like oh, right up awesome. your alley for sure. Well, yeah, and, really and cool. you know, content creator is is the key term here, right? Is that was one of the takeaways that I had from Apple's announcement was yes, the camera seems awesome. So much stuff geared towards content creation, better than ever. But not everybody is a content creator. You know, it's but, like if someone says to me, you know, is this camera the best one? I will say, yeah, it is. There's enough of them out there. There's a, and and enough of people who think they are or want to be or aspirational. Yeah, that, aspirational. Yeah. 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 No, I, I I don't think that you shouldn't try to use the tools afforded to you, uh, you know, in, in, in your next iPhone. Certainly do that. But I, I also think, I mean, even for me, I... I care about photography very much and i feel like the iphone 15 pro max has an amazing camera uh, i want to get to a few of these other uh outtakes from reviews and gadgets sherilyn Lowe uh said the camera button uh is a little awkward uh for anything other than taking a quick shot she's like oh yeah it's great 
if you just want to take a quick shot. It's it's actually better than the volume button, but it's really awkward. You kind of have to use it with two hands if you're going to swipe it and do any of the swiping. Uh, she said that there was accidental touches a lot of the times when she wasn't trying to use it and she accidentally brushed against it. Uh, Wired's Julian Jakatu said the phone is a little taller, making it harder to reach the top. But one of the reasons it's a little taller is bigger battery. And get this. Kimberly Getty and at Mashable said the iPhone 16 Pro Max lasted 25 hours and 17 minutes what? on a charge with the display at 50% yeah, in their test. Yeah, but what would she do? <laughs> they, they, just, they, do a regular, they do a regular iPhone battery check every time, and like, they just use it normally. Um, yeah. I would like to see more details about what they do, but yeah. I'm, I'm guessing it's not they just sit it quietly on a table. They have the screen on at 50%. They They're have it going. It's their, yeah. it's their TikTok review. You can see some of the stuff they do with it uh, on their TikTok. But. I don't know if I'm the only person, but I'm like, if I can go to 100%, then that's what I'm doing. Mm. I mean, unless I'm lost in the woods. 25 hours. <laughs> that's a lot. I'm into it. Yeah. That's I mean, that, that's why I'm so skeptical. If that's If that's even close to accurate. There's okay now. Mark me down for two major reasons. I'll probably do the sixteen, yeah. not the fifteen. I'm gonna. I mean, try, that's one of the things I'm gonna try when I get get one. Yeah. Is is like how long can I go without having to to recharge this thing? Right. Yeah. Because um, I feel like like if you're lucky to charge once a day, you know, we all probably have that part of our day when we're like, I'm gonna just be sitting here anyway. This is a good time to charge. You yeah. know that that is built into a lot of people's routines. Um, if, you know, if it dips below that, then it gets problematic, right? Because you're like, I don't know, you know, I, I can't go somewhere on my phone, uh, not enough charge. But if you get to the point where we're talking a couple days, you know, I mean, and or even more, then, then that, that, that really yeah. becomes just, it's just your device. I yeah. didn't see anyone else, uh, say 24, five hours, but I did see several other reviews praise the battery life and say the battery life is big, not just in the pro max, uh, mostly in the pro max, it's the longest because it's the biggest, but, mm. but a lot of people saying the battery life is exceptional in this round that alone. Uh, I think is going to make some people pay attention and say, you know what, maybe I'll just buy a new battery and it comes with a free phone wrapped around it. Because if your phone's old enough, that's kind of that's kind of what you do when you upgrade. Yeah. And it's always usually a complaint. Like usually it's oh, these batteries run hot or it's slower or it doesn't have as good a battery or the battery health. It's sometimes. Up. Yeah. Sometimes and then once they, in a while, the batteries like, aren't as good in the upgrade. Yeah. And once in a while when they are, I feel like those are the ones you want to jump on because you're going to probably have that thing for at least a couple of years. So do it. I mean, I don't I, want to shill for Apple, but I'm saying I'm yeah. getting it, I think. Yeah. I still am not convinced that this is a great upgrade, uh, mostly because I'm not as into the camera stuff uh, as a lot of people. I think camera enthusiasts may be overrepresented in, in reviewers here. Um, but uh, I, I do think that it seems like this is a, a much more solid uh, upgrade than maybe I was giving it credit for. And if you're still like, yeah, but Apple Intelligence, the only thing I want is Apple Intelligence. Uh, that is coming in October. You're not going to wait forever. Eventually, it'll be here. Uh, it comes to U.S. English first. Uh, they announced that more languages are coming uh, later. They previously announced support for Chinese, French, Japanese, and Spanish coming in 2025. And on Wednesday, they added to that list. German, Italian, Korean, Portuguese, and Vietnamese also coming to Apple Intelligence starting in 2025. And they said they'll, they'll have more to announce in the future. So there you go. Nice. If you want to talk in any of those languages, you can join the conversation in our Discord. Some of us may even speak those languages back to you. Who knows? Why don't you try out? out? Uh, join by linking a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Reuters reports that Sony chose to stick with AMD to provide the processor design for its upcoming PlayStation 6 game console. That's according to three sources familiar with the matter talking to Reuters. But Intel, for the first time, got to final consideration. Intel missed out winning the deal, didn't get it, potentially worth $30 billion, so, you know, that would have been a big one to snag because it couldn't agree to Sony's small profit margin reportedly. So the chips will be designed by AMD and manufactured by TSMC. Scott, why do you think this matters? Well, it's a big deal to AMD to keep the roll the the ball rolling 
Um, but I actually don't think it's that big a deal when it comes to Intel's role in this. Um, it's being framed by a lot of uh, sources as saying, well, they've lost the contract or, you know, this is a big loss for Intel. And it's easy to pile on Intel. I've got a number of problems in the last year or two. Uh, so I see why they're an easy target. But they never really were, had much of a hand in the console business. Um, in Sony's case, PS3 and before were proprietary chips. Um, they used this cell processor thing for the PS3. PS4 went to an x86 architecture. And since then, so the, Pro, the PS4, PS4 Pro, and PS4 5 and Pro for the 5, all using x86, but they're all using AMD chips. Uh, Microsoft, same thing. Microsoft got off the power PC platform after 360, and they've gone AMD every time. The only holdout in the console business that isn't doing any of those is Nintendo, and they use NVIDIA chips, and it is rumored, especially with a recent spec leak, that the Switch 2 will continue that trend and end up using the T239 processor, I believe, from NVIDIA. But the point is, this is more a story about uh, AMD having... You can make a broader picture and say, well, AMD's never had the stranglehold on the desktop market that Intel has. Intel's always been synonymous with the desktop market. Um, and that's true. But AMD has locked in these deals for a very long time. And not just for the CPU, often the GPU. In fact, as far as I know, since taking over for the two major console manufacturers, they have been both CPU and GPU provider. Makes sense. It's all under one roof. They work well together, so on and so forth. So I don't think there was actually much risk of that going away or changing. Um, I think it benefits Sony to kind of keep it the way it is and whatever Microsoft's next plans are, same thing. Um, so the story is less about Intel lost a deal and it's more like, no, turns out AMD has a pretty good handle on this console stuff and yeah. probably will for a, a while more. Intel needed this deal? It's not the only deal they needed, though. Uh, it wasn't like the entire future of Intel's foundry business uh, relied on this. Uh, but it would have been a big win, and it needs a big win. So I think that's why a lot of these stories were framed that way, is like Intel, especially the foundry business, the contract manufacturing business, uh, is is in need of clients. That's why it was big news that they got AWS to expand their deal uh, to make chips for it. Uh, this would have been a huge win for Intel, and the fact that they didn't get it means, well, they're still looking for those huge wins. Uh, but yeah, I'm with you. I don't, I'm not surprised that AMD got this there would have been more work on sony's end to do backwards compatibility if they had changed over to intel it, they could have done it but it would it's easier to just stick with amd yeah the architecture is there for them if they need to do that but what's more more key to them keeping them on board i think really is the marriage between uh cpu and gpu and this is something amd has chips they have all these ai chips they certainly could do more on the arm side of things but as long as we're staying with the x86 architecture why would you split that up? It's, it's the one advantage they have. NVIDIA is not making x86 chips. They make ARM-based chips, and they make GPUs. And splitting that up seems like a nightmare to me, uh, just having to deal with the two different companies and have that all jive together and then worrying about what devs have to do. Like, keep it all under the same roof. And I think that's it. the advantage that AMD had in the beginning, or at least since marriage with ATI, uh, and they have it now, and Intel just doesn't really have it. Yeah, that's just not their thing. So I, I think it's okay, and I don't think it really hurts Intel that much because it didn't hurt them in the last gen or the gen before that, and that's how long this has been going on. So, and I think that's why Intel quibbled about profit margins is that they were looking at this and saying, well, if we're going to take up a large amount of our process with the future of our foundry business on the line, uh, we need it to make a lot of money. And, and maybe it was smart for Intel to draw that line. A lot of people are like, oh, they got too greedy and they lost it. It may have been, you know, a, a Pyrrhic victory if they had got this and they were using up a lot of their capacity for a small, if consistent, uh, income level. I mean, the consistency of it is the attractive part. You you know you're going to keep making these chips for several years uh, if you get this contract. And you have a leg up on maybe getting the PS7, uh, you know, the, the next time around if, if they make a PS7. Uh, mm -hmm. But but it may turn out to to be fine if Intel can get other clients. That's the big question. The, the biggest question is, can Intel find any clients uh, for its foundry <laughs> business? Like, yeah. uh, this would have been gravy. Uh, we're still wondering if Intel can get mashed potatoes to put the gravy on. Yeah, and I'm sure that they were excited to go to these meetings and to be a part of the discussion. Oh, sure. I just think, also with the rumors floating around, that uh, talking within Sony is to make backwards compatibility a priority moving yeah. forward. 
they're not going to want to upset that Apple cart much, even though, like you said, it's not that big of a deal, AMD to Intel, in terms of the work they'd have to do. But it's still work and stuff they don't have to think of if they just stick with what they've got. So my prediction is, until we see something like a PS7, if that ever happens, we're not going to see any movement in this space. And this, suddenly Intel's like, oh, our foundry business can do this and this and this, and there's just zero reason. Yeah. And we're doing GPUs now, and they're compatible with this and that. If that happens... Great, they're in the running, but right now it just feels like they couldn't compete. And I, I almost wonder if Intel gets a side benefit where uh, some other Sony product will now use an Intel chip because they heard about it in the talks uh, with about the Sony PS Six. Except Sony's so compartmentalized, I'm not sure if that information is going to move around enough. But sure, but sure. who knows? That could be part of this too. To All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Chip in sunny Boston had some thoughts on our assisted driving conversation that we had on the show yesterday. Um, thank you, Chip, for the the long email. I will summarize it as best I can. Chip says, I drive a Mustang Mach-E with Ford's Blue Cruise driver assist system. Not only does it do a great job driving, it also requires the driver to pay attention to the road. On approved highways, it allows you to take your hands off the wheel as long as you're looking at the road. The system uses a driver-facing IR camera and IR lights to monitor the driver's eyes to make sure that you're looking at the road. If you look away from the road for more than a few seconds, you get a warning. If you continue to look away for longer, you get audible beeps, and eventually the car will slow itself down. Chip says, I agree the systems that require you to keep your hands on the wheel or really just bump the wheel every 30 seconds are not great systems. I just wanted to let you know that there are other and better systems out there. The systems need to be monitoring the driver's attention, not tension on the steering wheel. This is a great point, Chip. Uh, thank you for for writing in with this. Uh, and something we uh, didn't take into account when we were talking about this story yesterday. So I appreciate the, uh, the on-the-street expertise, if you will. Uh, I would like to see a study of these because... Again, the assumption is like, oh, well, if it's making you look at the road, it must be safer than the ones that make you bump the steering wheel. And that makes perfect sense to me, too. But is it? Let's put it to the test and find out. Maybe there's some other situation that comes up uh, that makes it unsafe in a different way or maybe we find out oh yeah no these are these are uh these are perfectly safe and and actually safer than not having them at all which even the ones that make you bump the steering wheel are safer than not having them at all they're just not as safe as full autonomy so uh good good stuff from chip thank you for emailing us man Indeed. Uh, thanks to everybody. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where you can send um, your your deepest thoughts uh, and questions. Uh, thanks to you, Scott Johnson. Boy, do we have questions for you. How long do you have? No, I have <laughs> I have the entire afternoon open. <laughs> Nothing but time. Nothing Scott but Johnson. time. I do have a lot going on, though. I will yeah. mention this. So whenever there's a lot of Sony talk, a lot of Microsoft talk, or even Nintendo talk, the place I get to really explode about it is on a show called Core. We do it every Thursday night. Uh, me and co-hosts talking all about the big stuff happening in the video game world, including the games that we're playing these days. So if that sounds fun to you, and if you are a gamer or just someone who likes watching that industry, check it out every Thursday at frogpants.com slash core. Patrons, stick around for the extended show Good Day Internet, a new social network launched that isn't worried about being infiltrated by bots one little bit because it's only bots. <laughs> you just get bot followers. You don't talk to people. Uh, stick around. We're going to talk about it. Reminder, we do our show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2000 UTC, and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow with Allison Sheridan. She's back from a vacation on Safari, where she used a lot of tech, and she'll tell us all about it. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>